everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesy, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Welcome to the Fourth Angels Message Seminar. We invite you to join us as we dig deep into the mind of God's truth. Our speak for today will be Evangelist Jimmy Kakur. Be blessed. Greetings once again, my beloved brothers and sisters, in the loving name of Jesus. I truly want to thank you so much once again for taking this time to be with me as we dig deep into the mind of God's precious truth. Beloved, today God has a precious, precious message in store for us. Today, brethren, we're going to be going here a little and there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 13. But first of all, brethren, I just want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 52. Brethren, this is going to be a deep revelation today. God has a powerful word for us today. So, may you give the Lord your undivided attention as we go into this presentation today. Isaiah 52 and verse 1, the Bible says, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. May God give us full understanding of his precious words, brethren. First of all, brethren, God says, awake, awake. Notice that God is repeating himself. God says, awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Now, who is Zion, brethren? Go back to the previous chapter, beloved. Isaiah 51 and verse 16. The Bible says, and I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of my hand, that I may plant the heavens, lay the foundations of the earth, and say unto Zion, Thou art my people. So very clear it is, brethren, Zion is God's people. Zion is God's church. But in Isaiah 52 and verse 1, the Bible says, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. So God is calling for his people to awake. It's very similar, brethren, to Joel chapter 2 and verse 1, where, where it says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm. Why do you use an alarm? To wake up. Right now, brethren, the church is fast asleep. But God is coming to her, knocking upon the door of her heart and saying, wake up, wake up, put on thy strength, O Zion. How does Zion put on strength? We put on strength, beloved, by separating ourselves from sin and sinners. We come close to the Lord by learning of, his, of him and of his ways and by separating from everything that is defiled and unclean. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, thy holy city. Brethren, what is the garment? The garment is none other than the beautiful robe of Christ's righteousness pure robe Jesus Christ his life that he wrought out during his 33 years on this earth covers us when we come to him we've since confessed and repented of he covers us wake awake O Zion Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. Jerusalem, the church. Zion, the church. But notice, brethren, once the church does that, once she awakes, once 
She puts on Christ's righteousness. Allows Jesus to clothe her with his beautiful robe of righteousness. Notice what the verse says. The Bible says from henceforth, from then on, there shall no more come into thee, into the church, the uncircumcised and the unclean. Oh, my brothers and sisters, we need to understand what that verse is saying right there. Right now are not the uncircumcised and the unclean in our midst, in the church? Are they not still coming in? Absolutely, yes. But there's coming a time that when the angels take out from Zion. Because brethren, the time is coming when judgment must first begin in the house of God. 1 Peter 4, 17. Psalm chapter 1 and verse 5, the Bible says, The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation. Of the righteous. Are there sinners in the congregation right now brethren of the righteous? Absolutely yes. But when the angels. Because this work of separation brethren. Is only committed to the angels. It is not committed to man. To judge. Or even to seek to uproot the tares. From the wheat. That work is fully committed to the reapers, the angels of God. So, the Bible says from henceforth, from then on, once the church awakes and puts on Christ's beautiful garment, his beautiful robe of righteousness, pure and clean, the Bible says from henceforth, there shall no more come into the church the uncircumcised, and the unclean. In other words, brethren, once the angels, even the five angels, each having slaughter weapons in their hands, in Ezekiel chapter 9, take out from the church the uncircumcised and the unclean, from then on, no more unconverted, no more uncircumcised in heart shall pass through the ranks of God's people. My beloved, that really shows us that the angels are going to take out and keep out of Zion the uncircumcised and the unclean. My brothers and sisters, look at verse 8. The Bible says, Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing. Perfect unity. With the voice together shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye. When the Lord shall bring again Zion. That's beautiful brethren. God is about to bring again Zion. Approximately 2,000 years ago. In the upper room. God had 120 disciples. Of one accord, of one mind. And he baptized them with the power of his Holy Spirit. And they went out, brethren, and they preached. For the first three and a half years, they tarried in Jerusalem. They remained in the church to bring to fulfillment the 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. But once the Jewish nation stoned Stephen... Then Paul says, it was expedient that the gospel first be preached unto you. But see, seeing that you prove yourselves unworthy of eternal life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. The time came, brethren, when the gospel had to go to the Gentiles. So brethren, God's going to have a people again. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing. Perfect unity. For they shall see eye to eye. When the Lord shall bring again Zion. Who are these people brethren? Who are these people? Let's go to the book of Joel. In the book of Joel beloved. Let's go to the book of Joel. 
chapter 2. And let's take a look, brethren, at verse... Let's begin from verse 6. The Bible says, Before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march everyone on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. What does that mean, brethren? They shall not break their ranks. First of all, brethren, when we think about ranks, what do we think about? We think about an army. Isn't that so? Look at verse 11. In verse 11, the Bible says, Joel chapter 2 and verse 11, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that execute of his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? They shall not break their ranks. This is the army of the Lord, beloved. God is raising up an army of workers, even the 11th hour workers. Who are these people, brethren? Go back to verse 7. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march everyone on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Perfect unity. Verse 8. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They're not even going to be wounded, my dear brethren. Suggesting and indicating and telling us that in these last days, every weapon, that is formed against God's people in these last days shall fall as powerless as straw to the ground. Isn't that what inspiration says, brethren? In the book, Early Writings, page 34, inspiration says, as the wicked rushed upon us, the swords that were raised to, to kill us fell as powerless as straw to the ground. That's right, my brothers and sisters. In these last days, God is going to be honoured in these last days by translating from the earth the 144,000 guiltless servants of God without tasting death. Oh, my beloved. And that's why inspiration says, let us strive with all the power that God has given us to be among the 144,000. Seven Bible Commentary, page 970. Isn't that beautiful, brethren? But now, brethren, once God gathers the 144,000, his army, the first fruits, Revelation 14, 4, these were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God. The first fruits of what? Naturally, brethren, they're the first fruits of the harvest. We are approaching the first fruit harvest where Jesus is going to put in the sickle and reap the first fruits, the 144,000. Remember, Ellen White, brethren, what was her very first vision that she received in the book Early Writings, page 15? She says, while I was at the family altar, the, God, the Holy Ghost fell upon me and I seemed to be rising higher and higher, far above this dark and wicked world. I looked for the Advent people in the world but could not find them. She could not see them. Then a voice said to her, look again and look a little higher. On this path, the Advent people were travelling to the city. But brethren, so sad, while they were travelling, Inspiration says she saw so many brethren falling off the path of righteousness and holiness down into the dark and wicked world below. Then she says, soon we heard the voice of God like many waters, which gave us the day and the hour of Jesus coming. The living saints, the 144,000 in number, knew and understood the voice. While the wicked thought it was thunder and an earthquake. Oh my brethren, on that path 
only the 144,000. In number, guiltless servants of God made it to the end. In number, what does that mean, brethren? When God, on the day of Pentecost, how many saints did he have in the upper room, brethren? Acts chapter 1 and verse 15. Peter stood up and he says there was about 120. And there was 120, brethren. There was 120. Oh, my dearly beloved. <laughs> there was 120. Do you know why there was 120, brethren? Do you know, brethren, that in the Bible, God has given us so much revelation of truth through figures and symbols. What am I really trying to say, brethren? In Acts chapter 1, brethren, how many days did Jesus stay on the earth after his resurrection? Acts chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. He remained 40 days on the earth. Now, brethren, do you think that was coincidence? That Jesus remained 40 days on the earth? Brethren, through the method of, of multiplication, God has revealed so much beautiful truth to us in these last days. Now, Jesus remained 40 days on the earth, brethren, after his resurrection. If I was to say to you, brethren, what is the number that represents the Godhead? You would say to me, number three. And rightly so. If I was to say to you, what does number seven represent? You would say completeness, perfection. How about number four? Globality. How about number ten? Universal. The number three represents the Godhead. Jesus, when he was on the earth, he represented the Godhead. In him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So what am I really getting to, brethren? When we times the number of the Godhead, which is the number three, by the number 40, the amount of days that Jesus stayed on the earth after his resurrection, we get 120. Do you think that was coincidence, brethren? What was Jesus doing during those 40 days while he was on the earth? He was gathering the 120, preparing them for Pentecost. And there was 120 disciples in the upper room. And we want to praise God, brethren. Beloved, as beautiful as this message is, and I've said this before, brethren, this truth is the present truth for these last days. It's the message that supersedes all other messages because it's the message that will seal the 144,000, not for resurrection, but for translation. So when we go back to Joel, brethren, after God gathers his army, the 144,000 in number, he's going to pour out the Holy Spirit upon them. Look at Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And it shall come to pass afterward. After God gathers them, he's going to pour out the latter rain of power, the Pentecostal power upon the 144,000 guiltless servants of God. Why is God going to pour out the hundred, upon the 144,000 brethren, the Holy Spirit? Why did he pour out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost upon the 120 disciples? Because they still had a work to do in proclaiming the gospel to the lost and to the perishing you see and that's why brethren the 144,000 are only the first fruits of the harvest revelation 14 4 a first fruit necessitates a second fruit and that's why brethren in revelation chapter 6 and verse 17 john says for the great day of his wrath is come who's going to be able to stand revelation 7 John gives us the answer. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John gives us the answer in Revelation 7, the next chapter. John saw 
two groups of saints standing in these last days. He saw the 144,000 from verses 1 through to 8. And from verse 9 to verse 17, he saw a great multitude, which no man could number, coming from every kindred, tongue, people and nation. Who's going to gather those from every kindred, tongue, people and nation, brethren? Who's going to preach the everlasting gospel to every kindred, tongue, people and nation? When we go to Revelation 14, verse 6 on down, it speaks to us about the three angels' messages. Who's going to preach those three angels' messages to every kindred, tongue, people, and nation with a loud cry? Brethren, right now, the loud cry hasn't even begun. And why do we say that? Oh, yes, it is swelling, but it hasn't swelled. Inspiration says in Review and Herod, November 19, 1908, it's only those. That overcome temptation in the strength of the mighty one that will be permitted to proclaim it. The third angel's message. When it swells. Oh yes brethren, it's swelling. But when it swells into a loud cry, it's only those that have overcome temptation in the strength of the mighty one. Who are they brethren? The 144,000 who have his father's name written in their foreheads. Oh, beloved, no guile in their mouth. Revelation 14 and verse 5. God's going to turn to them the pure language. Zephaniah 3 and verse 9. The pure gospel truth. Then will he give them the pure language. The pure language. What is this pure language, brethren? It's the pure gospel truth. The 144,000 will have no guile in their mouth. They're going to proclaim the loud cry. And they're the ones that will be sealed and overcome temptation in the strength of the mighty one. And they're the only ones that will be permitted to proclaim it. The third angel's message when it swells into a loud cry. You know, brethren, in Testament Volume 9, page 164, Inspiration says... In order to be purified and to remain pure, Seventh-day Adventists must have the Holy Spirit in their hearts and in their homes. The Lord has given me light that when the Israel of today humble themselves before him and cleanse the soul temple from all defilement, he will hear their prayers in behalf of the sick and will bless in the use of his remedies for disease. Oh, my beloved brethren, do we want to be among those people, brethren? The Israel of today, the 144,000, Revelation 7, 4, and I heard the number of them that were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Brethren, so God gathers his army, the 144,000, and he pours upon them the power of his Holy Spirit. Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. But now let's pick it up from verse 32, brethren. Look what the Bible says. So the Holy Spirit's being poured out upon the 144,000. And they're the ones that are going to proclaim the loud cry. What makes the crowd the cry loud? Well, one of the things that makes it loud, brethren, is the outpouring of the latter rain of power. That gives power to the third angel's message that gives power and force when God pours out the Pentecostal power upon the 144,000 they will be empowered to proclaim the third angel's message not in a faint cry oh no brethren but with a loud cry so the Holy Spirit is being poured out, brethren. But brethren, I have to emphasize this. Inspiration says, it only takes one sinner. One sinner, inspiration says, may diffuse darkness that will exclude the light of God from the entire congregation. 
Testaments, Volume 3, page 265. And inspiration says in Volume 5, 157, inspiration says, if the presence of one Achan in the days of Joshua was sufficient to weaken the whole camp of Israel, are we surprised today at the little success which attends our efforts? When every church and almost every family has its ache, my brothers and sisters. And that's why the days of the purification of the church, even the Seventh-day Adventist church, is hastening on a pace. In the mighty sifting soon to take place, we shall be better able to measure the strength of Israel. God is about to manifest that his fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly cleanse his floor, even the church. My beloved brothers and sisters, Joel chapter 2 and verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, that's after the latter rain of power has been poured out in verse 28. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Delivered where? What does the word say, brethren? For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Brothers and sisters, these words are too plain to be misunderstood. You see, beloved, when we read the Bible, we cannot make the Bible fit our own preconceived ideas and opinions. We have to make our ideas fit what the word says. Beloved, unless a figure or a symbol is employed, Great Controversy 599, we have to take the Bible as it reads. The Bible says, when God pours out the Holy Spirit, then whosoever from then on shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Brothers and sisters, I've shared this before that according to Micah chapter 4 and verse 8, the first dominion which Adam lost, the Garden of Eden, the kingdom on this earth, that was lost through sin. The first dominion shall be restored. Given to the daughters of Zion. Look at Micah brethren. Look at Micah chapter 4 and verse 8. Look what the Bible says brethren. And thou O tower of the flock. The stronghold of the daughter of Zion. Unto thee shall it come. Even the first dominion. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. And that's the premillennial kingdom before Jesus comes. The premillennial phase of God's kingdom on this earth. For in Mount Zion shall be deliverance and in Jerusalem. In other words, brethren, the final proclamation of the everlasting gospel. shall be proclaimed from Mount Zion and from Jerusalem. In other words, the headquarters of the final proclamation of the everlasting gospel is going to be from God's kingdom in Jerusalem, Mount Zion. And that's why Revelation 14.1, the 144,000 were standing on Mount Zion. With the lamb. Standing with the lamb because the lamb was still bleeding. Probation is still open. And that's why when you go down to verse 6. Who's going to preach the everlasting gospel? Revelation 14, 6. To every kindred, tongue, people and nation. With a loud cry. The 144,000. But from where? Brethren, don't miss this. 
Right now we have the sisterhood of churches scattered worldwide. The Seventh-day Adventist church is scattered worldwide. But once God purifies the church by the slaughter of Ezekiel 9, the final proclamation, the headquarters, is going to be from Jerusalem. The land that God gave unto our fathers, even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the first dominion comes to the daughter of Zion. What does that mean, brethren? The daughter of Zion. It doesn't say mother Zion, ancient Zion. No, the daughter of Zion is latter day Zion. The Zion of today. And God says the first dominion is going to come. The kingdom. It says the kingdom is going to come to the daughter of Zion. The 144,000 stand on Mount Zion with the Lamb. And from there, the headquarters for the final proclamation of the everlasting gospel is going to be from the Lamb. That God gave unto our fathers. Beloved. I know you're going to have a lot of questions on this point. Please visit, visit our website. Even go onto YouTube. Onto Cry Crowley Must. It's going to be a phone number. On the screen brethren please. Get in contact with us brethren. This message. Is. The present truth message. The restoration of all things. Didn't Jesus say in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 11 that when Elijah comes, he's going to restore all things? What are the things that needed to be restored? Well, the first dominion that Adam lost is going to come, even the kingdom, to the daughter of Zion. What was the question, brethren, that the disciples asked Jesus after he rose from the dead? In Acts chapter 1 and verse 6 and 7. They came to the Lord and said to him. Lord will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? The kingdom on the earth. Are you going to restore the kingdom on the earth at this time? Notice what Jesus said. He never said no I am not. He just simply said it is not for you to know. The times or the seasons. Which the father has put in his own power. Oh, my brethren. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. Let's go to different places, brethren. For out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Let's go. Since we went to Micah, brethren, let's stay, let's stay in Micah. In Micah chapter 4. Look at verse 1, brethren. Micah chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, But in the last days it shall come to pass. See, brethren, each of the ancient prophets spoke less for their own time than for ours, so that their prophesying is in full for us. Here we see Micah writing about the last days. What Micah wrote is for us. Look at Micah 4 and verse 1. But in the last days it shall come to pass. That the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established. What is this mountain of the house of the Lord, brethren, that is going to be established? That wasn't established prior to the last days. But in the last days, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills. And people shall flow into it. Hmm. Probation is still open here brethren. Look at verse 2. And many nations. Shall come and say come. And let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. To the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach it of his ways. And we will walk in his paths. For the law. Shall go forth of Zion. And the word of the Lord. From where brethren? From Jerusalem. In these last days. 
But in the last days, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. Brothers and sisters, this is the kingdom of God established on this earth. Brethren, do we have enough faith to believe that what the word says? Oh, brethren, if you was living in the days of Noah, would you have believed Noah's message? Would you have gotten into the ark or would you have waited to see the rain coming before you made a move to enter the ark? Brothers and sisters, the just shall live by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, the final headquarters for the final proclamation of the everlasting gospel, is going to be from God's kingdom, brethren, Jerusalem. The land that God gave unto our fathers, Mount Zion. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. And in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Look at verse 3, brethren, Micah 4 and verse 3. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. In the last days. Nation is not going to lift up sword against nation. Neither are they going to learn war anymore. In the last days. Beloved. What does it mean in the last days? Well brethren. Which is the last day of this earth's history? Turn me to John chapter 6. The Gospel of John, brethren, chapter 6 and verse 39. John chapter 6 and verse 39. Jesus speaking says, And this is the Father's will, which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. That's right, brethren. Unmistakable language. Jesus says the day of the resurrection, when the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with those in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The last day is the day of the resurrection, the second coming of Jesus. Therefore, last day's events are days before the last day. What we're seeing here in Micah, brethren, are probationary days. Probationary time. And they're going to beat their swords. Look what it says, brethren. They're going to beat their swords into plowshares. Their spears into pruning hooks. What do we use, at least anciently, what did people use spears for, brethren? And swords. Implements of war. So when Isaiah says they're going to beat their spears into pruning hooks, their swords into plowshares, nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn more anymore in the last days, brethren. That almost seems to be a contradiction to Matthew 24, when Jesus said, speaking about the last days, nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Oh, yes, brethren. There's going to be wars, but these nations that will be converted to the Lord when they see the end sign. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 12. God is going to lift up an end sign for the nations. The kingdom on this earth. Christ and his kingdom, beloved, is going to be the end sign for these last days. And yes, the 144,000 will go out and proclaim the third angel's message. As it swells into a loud cry. But brethren. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn more anymore. Look at verse 4. But they shall sit every man under his vine. And under his fig tree. And none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts. Has spoken it. Are you going to believe it beloved? Are you going to believe that what the word of God says. It will do. Are you going to wait in unbelief and like the foolish virgins 
arrive at the door too late, only to hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. Oh, my beloved brethren, these are solemn times. God wants to save us and God is raising up an army that will proclaim this message with a loud cry. Jeremiah chapter 51, brethren, and verse 19, the Bible says, The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the form of all things. And Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Verse 20. Thou art my battle axe. Referring to the portion of Jacob. The portion of the church. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. And with thee will I destroy kingdoms. Oh my brothers and sisters. How is God going to destroy kingdoms with the portion of Jacob? Because remember, inspiration says in Testaments Volume 1, page 608 and 609, in concluding this narrative, I would say that we are living in a most solemn time. In the last vision given me, I saw the startling fact that but a small portion of those who now profess the truth will be sanctified by it and be saved. Only a small portion, brethren. They will rise up against the simplicity of the work, conform to the world, cherish idols, and become spiritually dead? Is that what we want to experience, brethren? To become spiritually dead? Right now, God has given us this fresh revelation of truth. To awake, to arise and shine, because our light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. My brethren, the portion of Jacob, God says, with thee will I break in pieces the kingdoms and the nations. Through the proclamation of the everlasting gospel, God, through the 144,000 guiltless servants of God, will break in pieces the nations. Oh no, brethren, this is not a physical breaking, but through the preaching of the everlasting gospel, and that's why, beloved, when we turn to Daniel chapter 2, that is the same truth that we see there, brethren, in Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 34, Daniel says, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, that smote the image upon the feet that were partly iron and partly clay and broke the whole image to pieces. The stone was cut out without hands. From where was the stone cut out from, brethren? Verse 45. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out from the mountain. From the mountain without hands. But the interesting thing is, brethren, verse 35 tells us, Daniel 2.35, the stone that was cut out without hands when it smote the image upon the feet, what happened to the stone, brethren? It grew again and became a great mountain. Brethren, this is part of the prophecy that we haven't really understood. The stone was cut out without hands. It was cut out from the mountain without hands. Verse 45. But in verse 35, after the stone smite, smites the image, the stone grows. Hmm. Didn't Jesus say the kingdom of heaven is likened to a grain of mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds? But when it grows, it becomes the greatest among herbs, so that all the birds of the air come and lodge in it. Isn't that what happens to the stone, brethren? The stone grows, brethren. God's kingdom, God's kingdom church can only grow during probationary time. And that's why in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 28... Daniel says, but there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall come to pass in the latter days, in the last days. Last days, brethren, are days before Jesus comes. Daniel chapter 2, the fulfillment of Daniel 2 
are days before Jesus comes. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 28. But there is a God in heaven that reveal of secrets and make of known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what shall come to pass in the last days. And that's why even in verse 44, and in the days of these kings, what kings? The ten tolls, brethren, the ten tolls. Do you know that Ellen White says in Testament volume 1, 361, our position, she says, in the image of King Nebuchadnezzar is represented by the tolls in a divided state of a crumbling material that will not hold together. She says, prophecy shows us that the great day of God is right upon us. It hasteneth greatly. So true it is, brethren, we are living in the days of these kings, in the days of these tolls. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. What's so difficult to understand about that, brethren? The word of God doesn't say before the days of these kings, or after the days of these kings, but in the days of these kings, while these kings, while these nations, represented by the ten tolls, are still in power, and while they're still in rule. The stone, brethren, remember Jeremiah 51, 20, the portion of Jacob, even the 144,000, brethren, is that portion. That's why Ellen White says, in the last vision given me, I saw the startling fact that a small portion of those who now profess the truth amongst the professed people of God, even the Seventh-day Adventist Church, only a small portion will be saved. Oh, brothers and sisters, this is what Daniel chapter 2 is showing us, but we've never really understood it. The stone that is cut from the mountain represents the 144,000 cut out without hands. What does that mean? Without hands. Naturally, human beings make things and do things with their hands. The phrase without hands, Daniel 2.34, it shows that it was cut out by a supernatural power. It was cut out, in other words, brethren, by the hand of God. The stone cut out from the mountain, it's showing a separation. But what does the mountain represent, brethren? Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. The mountain of the Lord's house, the mountain of the Lord's church shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. The mountain of the Lord's house, brethren, the mountain of the Lord's church. Joel chapter 2 and verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. That's the church. And sound an alarm in my holy mountain, in my holy mountain, in the church. Sound the alarm in my church. Isaiah 56 and verse 7. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Oh, my brothers and sisters. The mountain represents the church in the last days. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 28. Because the complete fulfillment of Daniel chapter 2 will reach its climax and its fulfillment in our days, in the days of these kings. The mountain. Brethren, the church that God raised up in 1844, the church that God gave the three angels messages to, The sanctuary message, the spirit of prophecy. God raised up his precious church. During the dark ages, the papacy was treading the truth underground, under their feet. But God raised up the church in 1844. And the power that God gave to raise the truth from the ground that the papacy was treading under their feet was the three angels' messages. So what we're seeing here, brethren, represented by the mountain is the church in the last days. But which church is God using in his last days? Let's go to a few more scriptures, brethren. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 20. Turn with me there, brethren. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 20. 
The Bible says, and whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Notice that Daniel here is likening Israel unto a holy mountain. Israel, the church, is likening Israel unto a holy mountain. Oh, brethren, let's go to another one. Let's go to Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. Look what it says in verse 1, brethren. Hear ye now what the Lord saith. Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Verse 2. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. Oh, brethren. He will plead with Israel. That's his church. And God says in verse 1, Hear ye now what the Lord saith, Arise, contend thou before the mountains. What does that mean, contend before the mountains? Go and contend, not against, but before them. Take this message to the church. You see, this message must first go to the church and then eventually to the whole world. Because you will notice that the word mountains there is in its plural form. God must have a people just like when Jesus 2,000 years ago, brethren. He went to the professed people of that day. He said, I have not come but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They were lost. And Jesus went in the church and gathered 120, a finished product. And he poured upon them the Holy Spirit, the 120 disciples on the day of Pentecost. Brethren, a similar thing's going to happen again. But the only difference is this time it's going to be on a larger scale. Anciently, it was 120. In the antitype, it's going to be 144,000 in number. Was not the 120 a literal number on the day of Pentecost? Acts chapter 1 verse 15? Absolutely. The 144,000 is going to be a literal number. John says, I heard the number. Revelation 7, 4. Ellen White says in earlier writings, page 15 and 16. She says, the living saints. Soon we heard the voice of God, like many waters, which gave us the day and the hour of Jesus coming. The living saints, the 144,000 in number, knew and understood the voice, while the wicked thought it was thunder and an earthquake. So brethren, again, the mountain represents the church. The church in the last days. And from the simple fact that after the stone smites the image, what does that mean, brethren? The stone is the church purified. The remnant cut out from the mountain. Oh, my brothers and sisters, this people are a great people and they're strong. There has never been or ever shall be, even to the years of many generations. The stone, the remnant, the 144,000, the remnant of Jacob, the 144,000 cut out without hands from the church. This cutting out, brethren, represents the purification of the church. Even the slaughter of Ezekiel chapter 9. The days are at hand, brethren, when the five angels of Ezekiel chapter 9 will go through the midst of the church and bodily remove the unconverted. Why? Because one sinner, that's right, brethren, it only takes one sinner. One sinner may diffuse darkness that will exclude the light of God from the entire congregation. And inspiration says in volume 3, page 270, God's displeasure is upon his people and he will not manifest. He will not manifest his power in the midst of them while sins exist among them. And are fostered by those in responsible positions. Brethren, that's as clear as anything I have ever seen before. 
Testimonies Volume 3, page 270. God will not manifest his power in the midst of his people while sins exist among them and are fostered by those in responsible positions. So the mountain is symbolic of the church, even the Seventh-day Adventist church in these last days. But the church needs to be purified, brethren. And that's why in Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 3 it says, It's only he that is left in Zion, only he that remains in Jerusalem shall be called, shall be called holy. Even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. Verse 4. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. From the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. Oh my brethren. What did God say? When the Lord shall have washed away the filth. Brethren. For God to wash away the filth. That means there's filth in the church. Beloved, and that's why the, the purification of the church is imminent. The Seventh-day Adventist church is represented by the mountain. The 144,000, the remnant of Jacob. The church purified is represented by the stone. What does the stone do, brethren? It breaks in pieces. What did we read in Jeremiah 51 and verse 19 and 20? With the portion of Jacob. The remnant of Jacob, God is going to break in pieces the kingdoms of this world. Jeremiah 51 and verse 20. Look at Zechariah chapter 12, brethren. Look at Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 3. The Bible says, And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Here God represents Jerusalem. He likens Jerusalem unto a burdensome stone for all people. The Bible says all that burden themselves with it, that come against it, shall be what? Cut in pieces. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Brethren, isn't that the same work that the stone of Daniel 2 does? God represents Jerusalem here, the church. He likens it unto a burdensome stone. And all that come against the stone, all that burden themselves with it, shall be cut in pieces. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Beloved, the stone, the 144,000, church purified, after God cuts out the stone, separates them. After God purifies the church, he's going to baptize the 144,000. Joel chapter 2 and verse 28 with the power of his Holy Spirit, even the latter rain of power. But from the simple fact that the stone, after it smites the nations, represented by the feet. From the simple fact, brethren, that the stone grows and becomes a great mountain again. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 35. This goes to show, brethren, that this can only be during probationary time. What did the mountain represent? God's church, God's people. The fact that the stone grows and becomes a great mountain again. This represents the growth of the church. And this is exactly what I've been trying to teach us, brethren, and share with us. That the 144,000 are only the first fruits of the harvest. And they first fruit necessitates a second fruit. The 144,000, they're the first fruits of the great harvest field. But after God purifies them, he will send them. And through the proclamation of the everlasting gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit upon them, they're going to break in pieces that Babylonian system, the mark of the beast system, during the loud cry. And as a result of that, a great multitude will come out from every kindred of people and nation to join the ranks of the 144,000. And that's what causes the stone to grow from its first fruit phase. When the great multitude come in, the stone will grow from its first fruit phase. And become a great mountain again. And fill the whole earth. What does that mean brethren? Fill the whole earth. 
Brethren, in Isaiah chapter 11, God says, as the waters cover the sea, so shall my glory fill the face of the whole earth. What glory, brethren? Revelation 18.1. Go there, brethren. In closing, Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1, the Bible says, And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Who's going to take that light of glory to the whole earth? The 144,000. So the breaking, brethren, is not a physical breaking because the stone breaks in pieces. The nations, represented by the tolls, through the proclamation of the everlasting gospel. And that's why God says in Jeremiah 51, 20 again, Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. Referring to the church, the portion of Jacob. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. And with thee, that's what God says, and with thee will I break in pieces the nations. And with thee will I destroy kingdoms. That's what the, the word says, brethren. God is not going to literally send his people out with literal swords and, and battle axes. No. God says, you are my battle axe and weapons of war. And with you, I'm going to break in pieces. Through the proclamation of the everlasting gospel, the 144,000 guiltless servants of God will break that mark of the beast system to pieces. That Babylonian system. In that one hour. Maybe you're thinking brethren. What hour is this? Look at Revelation 18 brethren. Revelation 18 we read about verse 1. The angel that fills the whole world with his glory. Verse 4 says. And I heard another voice from heaven saying. Come out of her my people. That ye be not partakers of her sins. And that ye receive not of her plagues. See, the second fruits will have to be rushed out from Babylon. And that's why, brethren, in Obadiah 1 and verse 21, it says, and saviors shall come up on Mount Zion. There you go again, brethren, Mount Zion. Obadiah 1, 21. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau and the kingdom. There you go again, the kingdom. Shall be the Lord's saviors. The fact that the one for 4,000 are called saviors here, That goes to show that they still have a work of saving souls. And Saviour shall come up on Mount Zion. Who did John see in Revelation 14, 1, standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion? 144,000. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. What kingdom? Micah 4 and verse 8. The kingdom, the first dominion, shall come to the daughter of Zion. Jerusalem. But the one hour, brethren, when the 144,000, beloved, are cut out after Ezekiel 9 and sent to the nations to proclaim the everlasting gospel, then they're going to accomplish the greatest amount of work in the shortest duration of time. Look up Revelation 18, brethren. Look up verse 9 and 10. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. The one hour. Brethren, look up verse 15 to 17, Revelation 18. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, the merchants, and saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour, so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster, the traders, and all the company in ships and sailors, and as many as trade by sea, stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like unto this city? The one hour again, brethren. It's also mentioned in verse 19. And they cast dust on their heads 
and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. Brothers and sisters, three places in Revelation 18 is that one hour mentioned. The only place where you're going to find the one hour is in Matthew chapter 20. The 11th hour laborers. Remember, the householder went out at five different intervals. Early in the morning, the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and the 11th hour. The 11th hour laborers, the 144,000, from the 11th hour to the 12th. From the 11th hour to the 12th. Sunset, representing the close of probation for the whole world. In that one hour, the 144,000, the stone cut out from the mountain. Complete spiritual vision. Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 9. The stone with seven eyes. The men wondered at. Zechariah 3 and verse 8. The stone brethren. The men wondered at. Because remember Ellen White says. The men wondered at. In Zechariah 3 8. Of the 144,000. Prophets and kings 592. The men wondered at. Are the 144,000, she says. Now is reached the complete fulfillment of the words of the angel. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. And the previous verses, she's talking about the 144,000. The previous paragraph, she's speaking about the 144,000. So the men wondered at the 144,000. Zechariah 3, verse 8, but verse 9 it speaks about the stone that was before Joshua, having seven eyes. Who was before Joshua? The men wondered at. The 144,000. So brethren, we have scripture. Zechariah 12 and verse 3. Zechariah 3 and verse 9. That proves unmistakably that the stone, brethren, the stone is not Jesus personally, but it's Christ reproduced in his, in his people. In his church. And that's why the 144,000 have his father's name written in their foreheads. Furthermore, brethren, the fact that the stone grows and becomes a great mountain, Jesus does not grow personally and become a great mountain, a great church. This can only be fulfilled through the church, the church triumphant. So, my beloved, that one hour, that one symbolical hour, the 144,000 guiltless servants of God, the stone cut out without hands, will accomplish the greatest amount of work in the shortest duration of time and bring from every kindred and people and nation a great multitude which no man could number. Oh, my brothers and sisters, where are the majority of God's children to be found right now? Still in the world, in the nominal churches of Christendom and in the world at large when is God going to bring them after he purifies the church in closing Isaiah 66 beloved Isaiah chapter 66 in closing brethren look at Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 19 the Bible says very clearly brethren in verse 19 and I will set a sign or a seal among them and I will send those that escape of them to the nations. To Tarshish, to Portolu, that draw the bow. To Tuba and to Javan, to the islands afar off that have not heard my fame. Neither have seen my glory. And they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Brethren, these words are so plain that they cannot be misunderstood. God said, I'm going to set a sign among them. I'm going to seal my people. And I'm going to send those that escape, escape the cutting out, to the nations... The tolls that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, showing that probation is still open for the world. And they're going to declare my glory to the Gentiles. Probation is still open. They're still going to declare after they escape, after they cut out. Look up verse 20. And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations, upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts. To my holy mountain Jerusalem saith the Lord. As the children of Israel, the 144,000, Revelation 7, 4. As the children of Israel 
bring an offering, that's their brethren, into a clean vessel, into the house of the Lord. You see, brethren, this is God's program. We must believe God. We can't try and do things our way. It's only God's method that's going to endure. It's only God's method that's going to be victorious. God said, I'm going to seal my people. I'm going to send those that escape. Escape what? Look up verse 16. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. What slain of the Lord? That's the slain of Ezekiel 9. Testaments, volume 1, page 189, 190. And I saw that the Lord was wetting his sword in heaven to cut them down. Oh, that every lukewarm professor could realize the clean work that God is about to make amongst his professed people. Oh, my brothers and sisters, God's about to purify the church. He seals the 144,000 first fruits. And then he sends those that escape Ezekiel 9 to the nations afar off that have not heard his fame neither have seen his glory and they're going to bring a great multitude into a clean vessel into the house of the Lord notice brethren when the one for four thousand go out to preach they bring the second fruits of the living the great multitude they bring them into a clean vessel into the house of the Lord showing that the house of the Lord has already been purified before the loud cry begins and that's why Joel chapter 2 and verse 32 says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord after God pours out the Holy Spirit of Joel chapter 2 and verse 28 whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call brothers and sisters what a beautiful message message what a beautiful truth what a glorious message God has given us the thing is brethren do we have enough faith because Jesus said when the son of man comes will he find faith on the earth my brothers and sisters we have heard the message today God has spoken to our hearts God loves us so much brethren he has given us this precious message. May God's grace empower us to receive it by faith and to run with it and to share it, brethren, with everyone grass in the field. I love you so much, brethren. Thank you for joining me today. May God bless you and keep you. May God cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Until we meet again, in Jesus' precious and glorious name, amen and amen. Praise God, amen. We trust that your hearts have been stirred by the ever unfolding revelations of God's prophetic word. There are also many more prophetic studies available to you. For further information, please contact us. 1-800-729-7494 or visit us on the World Wide Web at www.3angelsherald.org Thank you.